pretty straightforward. We know that England can produce more wine than they can than they can cloth. So here's our production possibilities frontier, which of course is scale the same thing as uh, our ISO value line, and will also be the same as our uh, budget constraint. Now we need to put our community or country in a different curve on here. But we, remember, we made an assumption earlier. I don't know what assumption was. Six, something like that. That um, country in difference or demand was homogeneous, which means that at the same relative prices, consumers in both countries will consume the same relative quantities. That is, their level of income doesn't matter. So being prices rich to somebody else doesn't change the relative quantity of what you are consuming, only the relative prices. What that means in the terms of looking at England is England's country and difference curve can look exactly the same as what we have here. And I can't draw it exactly the same. So I just want you to think about the slope of the production possibilities from here in Portugal and the slope of the production possibilities from here in England. So one of the things that you can see is that the tangency for England has to be to the left of it where it is for Portugal. Now I'll try and draw it as close as I can, but much easier if you actually aren't trying to do this for you. That's close. So this is a country in difference curve for England that maximizes our consumer's economic well-being or utility. We can still call this point A for England. And notice what happens here. When we're producing and consuming at point A, it's still true that the demand for wine is equal to the supply of wine. And that the demand for cloth is equal to the supply of cloth. It's also true, by the way, that the marginal rate of transformation equals marginal rate of substitution, so we don't need to go through that again. But notice that the ratio of cloth to wine that's produced and consumed is relatively low. So in Portugal, we're producing and consuming a relatively large amount of cloth. In England, we're producing and consuming a relatively large amount of wine. So the Portuguese are less, and the English are really happy. Or at least not nearly the rest of the world. Okay. Now. Let's think about prices. How do we deal with prices in all of this? So we'll just uh, use some nomenclature here. P sub C is the price of cloth, P sub W is the price of wine. So the ratio of the price of cloth to the price of wine is simply called the relative price of wine. I'm sorry, the relative price of cloth. It's always the term in the numerator. Now, one of the things that we know is that in a competitive economy, and remember one of our assumptions was production took place under conditions of perfect competition. In a uh, competitive economy, workers will be hired up to the point where their nominal wage is equal to the value of their margin of product of labor. So here's the value of marginal product of labor in the cloth industry. So the wage, the nominal wage, will simply be the price of cloth divided by the unit labor requirement. This will give us the value of our marginal product of labor. I'm sorry, you lost Right. Right. Oh, okay. No, no, we will continue to hire until the wage that we have to pay equals the marginal product. So this is this is a equilibrium condition. If the wage is less, so think about what this means. The wage is what you have to pay workers to come work for you. So it's total compensation, by the way, not just the wage. The value of the marginal product is the additional revenue that that worker's efforts bring into the firm. So as long as the worker can bring in more than what you actually have to pay, you're going to hire that person. You'll continue to hire those people, additional workers, until you get to this equality. This is the equilibrium condition. You won't hire the next worker if, in fact, the wage now exceeds the marginal product, the value of the marginal product. So this is the equilibrium condition. Okay, now let's keep this part. Keep this part in mind because we're going to do a little uh, a little transformation here. Okay, so let's suppose this is just a supposition. I'm not saying this is going to happen. Let's suppose for the moment that the wage rate in the cloth industry is higher than the wage rate in the wine industry. Now remember, we only have one factor of production: workers. And workers are freely and costlessly mobile between industries for both countries. But we're just looking at the Portugal right now. So this is true for both countries. So if the wage rate for in cloth in the cloth industry is higher than the wine industry, this just is the wage rate. Written in prices and you know, labor costs. Now, you don't have a requirement for And we can transform that to the relative price of cloth. So this is the relative price. So what this says, this is the relative price of cloth is greater than, what's this expression? What do we call that? It's the ratio of the labor requirements, which is the opportunity cost of producing cloth. So if the price that you can get for the cloth exceeds the opportunity cost, all you want to do is produce cloth. Remember, workers are pretty mobile. They're all going to go to the cloth industry because it's paying a higher, it's, it is paying a higher wage. Uh oh, now we've got a country that's only well dressed but not having much fun. So let's think about the opposite situation. What happens if the wage in the cloth industry is less than the wage in the wine industry? Well, of course, it's just the opposite. What we see here is the relative price of cloth 
is less than the opportunity cost of producing corn. So in that situation, you only want to make wine. So here you run around making, but you're very happy and don't really care very much that you've had a lot of wine. So notice that in the first two situations, the country's only going to be producing one of the two goods, which of course doesn't sound like an equilibrium condition, because of course we would like to be more aggressive and be something else. So if we see wages in both industries equalize, then the relative price equals the opportunity cost. Workers will be indifferent to which industry they're working in, so we'll be producing some of both goods, and the actual quantity of wine cloth that we'll be producing will be determined by consumer taste and preferences. So this then gives us an equilibrium condition. So, in the absence of international trade, if a country wants to produce and consume both goods, both baskets of goods, then wages need to equalize uh, between the industries. So let's see what that means. Here's our relative price of cloth. Now, I say it's equal to one half. Well, we know that because in equilibrium, the relative price has to equal the ratio of the unit labor cost, which is the opportunity cost, which also equals one half. So let's just pick 10 and 20. We can pick 20 and 40, 5 and 10, any ratio. It's the ratio that matters, not the dollar amounts. And then we can calculate what the wages must be in both industries. You can notice that they are both $10. We can do the same thing for England. Again, this is nothing more than the ratio of the unit labor requirements. <coughs> So it's that ratio that matters. Let's say it's 10, or 20 and 10. And we calculate the wages. You notice again, the wages are identical in both industries, but they're very different in England than they are in Portugal. So again, what we want to think about in our car here, we want to consume some, produce and consume some of both goods. In order to do that, workers have to be indifferent about working in either industry. And the only way that they will be indifferent about working in either of the industries is if, if the wages are identical in both industries. So that will um, tell us what we're uh, looking for. Now. Finally, then, we can see then that the relative price of cloth in Portugal is one half. The relative price of cloth in England is two. This allows us to look at what relative prices in the two countries look like. Now, notice we're talking about relative prices and relative quantities. Relative prices, relative quantities. So this is how much cloth is being produced, versus, or uh, the quantity of cloth divided by the quantity of wine. But if you want to think about that as demand or supply, it doesn't particularly matter because they're the same. And we have a relative price of cloth on the vertical axis. Well, what we've seen is that Portugal has a relative price of cloth that is one half. This is what we call Portugal's relative supply curve. Oops, no answer. England also has a relative price, but it's of two, much higher. This is our relative supply curve for England. Why are these horizontal lines? Typically, we think of a supply curve as being upward sloping. But these are horizontal lines. And this follows directly from our assumption that we have constant labor productivity, or constant technology, or constant labor, unit labor requirement. If you have constant labor productivity, your production functions have, they don't turn out to be straight lines, they have constant slopes, without diminishing returns to labor, you don't get upward sloping cost curves. Therefore, you don't get upward sloping supply curve. So notice that the relative price of cloth is higher in England than it is in Portugal. Now, the other thing we need in all of this, though, is relative demand curve. Now remember, one of the assumptions that we made, our homothetic assumption about demand curves, says that only relative prices matter, not income levels. So since all we have is relative prices on the vertical axis, the demand curve, the relative demand curve for both countries are identical. This is by assumption. Just keep it easier. But notice what this tells us. Here's Portugal with a relatively high relative quantity of cloth, and here's England with a relatively low quantity of cloth. Did we see that earlier? So when we look at just the production possibility frontier in a country in different curve, we also saw that Portugal would consume a relatively high quantity of cloth, and England would produce a relatively low relative quantity of cloth. So we're seeing exactly the same thing in both instances. In both instances. Now, what we're going to do on Thursday is start here, and then ask ourselves, okay, what happens when we open up these two countries' international trade? Let's suppose that the Portuguese and the English can actually trade with one another uh, rather than having to produce both goods and services themselves. So that's what we're going to look for on Thursday.